Um, so Grady, it is so nice to meet you and thank you for being here. And um, thank you for your amazing book. It was actually picked by, um, by the audience, which is super fun. And I feel like it was a fantastic book to really go out of the gate with our first, for the first book for our, our book club. Um, I know that personally, I was really moved and I was delightfully entertained by your book. Um, and it couldn't have come at a better time oh. um, being at the house in, in quarantine. I felt like it was just like, just such a, a great escape. And I was particularly drawn to it because I am a wife and I am a mother and I really felt strongly towards the protagonist because I too sometimes feel like a housewife and stuck at home and feel like I need an outlet and I need something to be heard and felt heard. And, um, and I really love that you made her into a sort of superhero um, and how you wove this like fun thriller that I really felt like I, I felt so satisfied by the end. And I, um, I really love how you confront stereotypes and use the American housewife as a trope. And I think that when you do this in writing, you as the author are able to elicit a response from the reader that they can confront in private. I think that often when it happens in the present moment that we as, as women don't know how to handle it and we like Patricia kind of brush it off with politeness and pleasantries and um, don't really get to actually deal with that. And I think that by reading it on the page, it's like satisfying to like confront this. And, um, and I found it really satisfying to be confrontational on the page and watch Patricia come out of this people pleasing and advocating for herself. Right. Um, I thought it was just a brave choice for you to write this as a male author. And I'm really glad that you did that. I think it was, it was a really great perspective and a great narrative. And it was a much needed relief for me during the pandemic. And it was nice to get lost in the story. And I would, I would love to hear about, about your choices in writing the book and within your narrative. I'm gonna, one of the questions just came up from a reader, which is um, that, I, that also was, was difficult, I think, to read, which is the gaslighting sequence, which is left oh, right. a lot of people angry and upset. Um, and what was it like writing a, such a chapter? Um, and what do you think, oh, what do I think about this scene? Um, so what was it like writing, I'm not sure which sequence, there's several sequences I, I, I found with the gaslighting, especially at the end when, um, you know, the women are all together and they, they, they are expecting the, the inspectors to come in and the men are like, we're not calling them, you're embarrassing yourselves. Or, right. um, I mean, there are multiple scenes where they're like, no, listen, listen, listen. Um, I guess what's your take on that? And was that difficult to write or, um, well, you know, it's funny because there was earlier, there. Were, I'm a very inefficient writer. So there's like, like two other versions of this book that no one will ever see that like one was from each chapter is a different character's point of view. And so I have all this background information on the other characters and things. And, you know, Kitty's husband, Horse, and Mary Ellen's husband, Ed, are actually really nice guys. And they just sort of got lost from the narrative. So you wind up with just the super toxic marriages. So I feel bad <laughs> about that. But yeah, it's, I mean, this is really, I grew up in a town. I mean, I grew up in South Carolina in Charleston and everyone was a doctor or a lawyer. And when I say everyone, I mean all the dads because I was born in the seventies, grew up in the late seventies, mm -hmm. early eighties, and very few women made it into these, these jobs. They were there, but especially in Charleston, these were law firms that didn't hire women. I mean, these were courtrooms that a female attorney wearing pants was not allowed in. She would have to go out and change into a skirt or a dress. Um, and this is in the eighties. Um, and you know, it was harder. And so what I saw was these guys and doctors and lawyers are very sure of themselves. And they really believe they have all the answers and they don't have it. It's not a question worth asking. And so I grew up around dudes who really were the last word on everything. And I watched moms trying to navigate that. And, you know, sometimes it was done in a funny fashion. Sometimes it was done in a horrible fashion, but it was just sort of like growing up. You just, that was the lesson you took in that, these guys set these rules and it was up to women to navigate it. And if they said this was the end of the discussion, it was the end of the discussion. But like, so to me, 
is I saw women having to sort of like break the boundaries of acceptable conversation to navigate this stuff because the rules were being set by guys. And it's what my wife did at that meal. And it's a little bit what Patricia does in the sense that she's not taking those pills to kill herself. She's like, you want me to take these pills? I'll take these pills. I'll take all these pills. And she's not thinking about the next step because she's so consumed by anger because she's been so humiliated. I mean, that's where anger comes from, you know, that kind of humiliation. And she's not thinking about it, but she doesn't care. In that moment, she is flat out proving a point. Um, and so, so that was sort of one of these things. And with these guys gaslighting them, it's interesting that gaslighting has become this word these days because it's like, yeah, finally there's a word to describe kind right. of like all these conversations I saw for so many years. Yeah. Like, this isn't happening. You're wrong. You're imagining. This is not your reality. This is the reality. And you're like questioning, like, well, am I, is this, am I right? Is this wrong? You know, he might. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, I, I read it and I, to be honest, completely empathized. And it didn't seem out of character for her to do that because I feel like when you're in a position where you're not heard and you don't have an outlet or an ability to, feel like someone's listening. I mean, it seemed yeah. like time that was her only option. I mean, if, if she, I would think that if she wanted to, she, I don't know much about suicide, but I feel like if you want to do it, you, you know, it's a cry for help. And right. I think she, that cry for help, she needed to say, I need someone to listen to me. And, um, yeah. And then it well, it's interesting you say that because, you know, when I was growing up, um, you know, one of those things as a teenager, you're always like fascinated by and terrified by is like people, people with mental illness and like people, you know, in school who get like put in a locked ward or an institution or something. And, you know, and there was always this term I hated, which was like a suicide gesture. And I was always like, you'd hear that and like, oh, so it wasn't right. It was a suicide. And I'm like, it's is that? so, yeah, it's like such a, dis this person is like screaming for someone to oh. pay attention to what's happening. And like, it's being dismissed as sort of this like theatrical moment. It was so weird to me. And like you said just a minute ago, if no one's listening to you, how do you get people to listen to you? I don't know. I mean, how do you do it? I, I do you break things? Do you, I mean, what is it you do? It's one of these things we entered into with this whole, with, with the Black Lives Matters protests, with um, the looting. And, you know, I, my dad is a staunch Fox News watcher and everything, nothing against it, but it's really, that's sort of who he is. Mm -hmm. And he was going on about the looting. And I'm like, really? Right. Like out of all this, you care about a Dwayne Reed? Like it's, right. <laughs> how else do you get people to listen, but to like, you know, break the things they clearly value more than you? I don't, how do you, you know, it's, it's, and, and it, then it makes you more dismissible though. And I think that happens with, with women. I think it happens with anyone who's marginalized to get people to listen. You have to break the rules. You have to break things. You have to break out of where you are. But when you do that, oh, well, they're having a moment. They're having a gesture. Right. They're, they're going too far and you become dismissible. So it's this double-edged sword. Well, and it's tough because I remember I was watching, I think something on PBS and they were talking about women's suffrage and the right to vote. And I think a combination of that and Robin DeCamillo's book on um, white fragility and just this notion that you have to ask for permission. So these men are in this power position right. and women then have to ask them for permission to have equality and then the same for Black Lives Matter. Like it just really put things into perspective of how unequal it is that you have to ask for that person of power to grant you access, which is Right. Kind of mind blowing to think about. Um, one of the things stuck out is about the marginalized neighborhoods and the fact that they were the ones who were struck first and then no one believed them. The police, you know, they were saying, what are the police right. going to do? Um, and then in a way, Patricia sort of saves them in a way. And one might say that this is an act of, of white saving, you know, where it's a white person helps provide, um, who helps non-white people in a self-serving manner, um, which might reduce Mrs. Green's own strength and narrative. Um, given that we all must be more accountable and confrontational with racial inequality, do you feel like you would have written this differently given the opportunity, or do you feel like that this was important recognizing and calling out the inequalities and highlighting them for the reader? Yeah, what, what's hard for me is, 
I wanted to write what I saw. Like, I mean, this is where I grew up and roughly when I grew up. Um, and so what you have to deal with is, is a lot of people who aren't woke and a system that's very inequitable. And so one of the ways I thought through it when I was thinking about it was James Harris moves to this town because he's realized that there's coming to be a time, there's more and more security cameras, there's more and more computer records. If you want to live in the world, you need photo ID, you need a bank account, you need property. And so he needs to set down roots before it's too late. And he realizes the place where he can go that will take him at face value as a white guy with money who presents as a very educated, well-mannered guy is, a, is one of these small Southern towns. Um, and that has an added bonus for him that as long as he feels like as long as he preys on the marginalized people, no one's going to care. And I mean, that's something we see with law enforcement all the time. I mean, one of the things that's really interesting to me is there used to be a profile of a serial killer. They were mostly Caucasian. And now what people are realizing is there are African-American serial killers as well. Just no one ever investigated those crimes and linked them up. No one cared enough to look like the Grim Sleeper in LA was one. There's one in North Carolina. The victims were so marginal because they were African-American, because they were poor, that their crimes were just not ever investigated with any seriousness. Um, and so he feels like as long as he preys on the marginalized people who are the poor people who are in that part of the South at that time, African-American predominantly, um, no one will care. No one will look into it. He will get away with it. And what he doesn't count on is that, at least in houses I grew up in and around, every family interacted with someone who is African-American almost every day, as a, as a, who cleaned, who took care of their kids, who was a home health care worker, who, was, who did something with them and was really intertwined with their lives. And they knew each other. And those relationships were really complicated by issues of class and race and all these things, but they knew each other and they could talk to each other. And one thing moms do, I feel, not everyone, I'm generalizing, but in general, mm -hmm. they relate to other people's kids. They care about other people's kids. They see other people's kids and they see their own kids in them, no matter if those kids are poor or, you know, another ethnicity or another religion, whatever they are, they see their kids in those kids. And so what James Harris doesn't count on is these women speak and they talk and they interact and that's his flaw. And I get what you mean. I know what you mean, that sort of white savior thing, but this is what happens with marginalized communities. And we see it now, even with, um, and I don't mean to sound too grandiose, the global warming. Right. Marginalized communities are the ones that hit, get hit first. Yeah. They have less of a buffer. Yeah. Um, whether it's tribes people in sub-Saharan Africa or fishermen in Indonesia, they are suddenly uprooted and have to become refugees practically to find a better life because of global warming. Mm -hmm. We ignore it because we have that luxury, but it will happen to us eventually. And it's the same with Six Mile in the book. It will happen to everyone eventually because hunger never stops. You know, vampires don't ever get full. Right. Like he will keep going. Um, and you know, and one thing that's important to me, and I had it in an earlier draft of the book and in the end and sort of left it out later just because I didn't want to keep going and going. Like there's a point where you're like, I stuck the ending. I don't need to keep taking a bow. But Ms. Green doesn't forgive them. And she has that moment with Grace at the end of the book where she's like, we were right and you were wrong and children died. And Grace says, you're right. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the reality. And that's been the reality for a long, long time. And I wish I could write a better one. I wish I could write a happier one. But I was sort of, I felt confined by what I saw, which is these women can interact to a point, but there's a point where they don't. Um, and there's a reality where Six Mile can't have justice for itself because Six Mile are people who aren't taken seriously by the police. They're not taken seriously by the power structures. Um, and that changes over time. But in 1993, right. no way. They have to have someone advocating for them who's not African-American, who doesn't live there, because otherwise everyone in power will dismiss them. Well, and I appreciate you, I appreciate your honesty in saying that because I think so much what happens now, and um, I remember reading about history books in Texas or even just um, American classics and literature and changing the names of characters to 
um, not be as offensive. And it is, it's difficult confronting these stereotypes. It's difficult confronting the fact that some are in a place of privilege and some aren't, and it's really um, unfair and it's, and we need to do something about it, especially being white people. And we are in a place of, of more privilege and power. And I think what is helpful about your account is that it is honest and being able to read that and recognize that and say from a reader's perspective, I mean, you know, you could read it as like a great narrative, which it is, and it's a fun story, but digging deeper again and recognizing how the disparity in the neighborhoods um, and the difference in the two neighborhoods and going like, shit, how do we 20 years from now, maybe write hopefully a tale where we can be honest and say like, we're on more equal footing or equal footing right. or, you know? Um, yeah. So I, I appreciate you being honest about that and not saying like, you're right, I would totally write it different. I should have added more diversity in the book club or what have you. I think um, you being able to write about such, to write in, I think, in a, some stereotype form and make it extreme in a way to like really be confrontational about it. Mm -hmm. So I, I appreciate that you did that. It's, it's funny, someone asked in the comments about vampires being this symbol for sort of rapacious men who take and take. Mm -hmm. And that's really interesting. You know, one of the things that happened earlier, and you said something about blood. Um, and one of the things that happened early on with this book is I'd started writing it and I was going home to visit family in, in South Carolina. And the plane was coming into land and I was looking out the window, just sort of spaced out. And um, I realized that Charleston's on the coast and it's lots of wetlands, lots of rivers, all that stuff. And I was looking at him, I was like, oh, this, like looking at the rivers that go into creeks, that go into wetlands and all this, I was like, this looks like a giant circulatory system with arteries and then the creeks are veins and you got these little like inlets that are like little capillaries. And someone was building some kind of condominium development, like right smack in the middle. There's this big, ugly pile of like just gray death. And I was thinking, you know, it looked like an apple you took a bite out of and just left to sit there. And I remember thinking, that's like a freaking vampire just bit this, bit this environment. And the 90s were really when like a lot of places like Charleston started to develop and overdevelop and really just the 90s were a weird era. I mean, you grew up in them, where it was like a lot of weird stuff was going on, but everyone was like, you know, the banks were getting deregulated. We had our first president, or recent president impeached. Um, you had the first Gulf War. All this stuff was happening. Women had this weird arc in the 90s from like every female singer-songwriter releasing their first album in the early 90s from like Beyonce and Destiny's Child to Amy Grant to Celine Dion to Alanis Morissette. And yeah. the March for Women's Lives and all this stuff to the end of the 90s, which was sort of like porno chic. And it was all like boy bands and like everything. Every, the iconic image of a woman in a magazine like was with a cigar and a glass of scotch and like a tailored right. suit. Yeah, it yeah. was so, yeah, it was so weird. Um, and I was like, but everyone was making so much money. There was this idea of just, shh, just don't mess it up. Just don't, just, just ignore that stuff. And that was really this image I had of vampires, just it's like not just eating for themselves, but just taking everything again. Like they, there's no way for them to be full. They're, they're always going to eat. And there is that thing with like, when you think of overdevelopment, when you think of all this stuff, when you think of these guys crashing these like giant companies, you know, and just extend the banking crisis and extending these mortgages, it's just like no one ever believes that the bill's going to come. You know, yeah. it's just like, let's just keep ordering. World tech, like no moral compass where someone's like, hey, this isn't adding up. This isn't making a lot of sense because there's so much expansion and so much momentum that no yeah. one's stopping to say like, hey, wait a minute. What is at the end of this? What are the consequences of all of this? Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's this idea that people refer to themselves. I saw this thing recently where people were talking in an article about consumers and I'm like, oh my God, like, are we just like vampires? We're all consumers. We just consume and consume. Like, that's so weird. Um, I, I don't know what the other better word is. Citizen? Person? I don't know. My stepfather actually went to UW um, and uh, one of his friends in college actually was um, killed by Ted Bundy. Oh my so God, really? 
Yeah, I um, I have I don't know much about about it. He's never really talked about it in depth or anything. I don't, I don't know how close they were, but right. Um, but then when I was sort of when I was reading through your book and I read about Anne Rule and and this well the the character's fascination with the horror stories and then also um that just woven in i i i was fascinated to hear that she had no idea i mean that's just yeah weird. well and one of the things she says in the book is i watched him save lives like i watched him talk down suicide they worked at a suicide hotline therefore she's it's like, okay or she's like wrestling it in her no head? she's like i so i could never how do these two people exist yeah he treats people like they're not human. On the other hand, I've seen him be incredibly empathic and compassionate and save people's lives. How is this a person? Mm -hmm. Like, how does this work? Um, it's really amazing. That is wild. Yeah. But one of the interesting things you just said about your, your uncle, right? My stepdad. Stepdad, sorry, sorry. Is, you know, we all know these serial killers' names and we never know the names of their victims, which is so strange. Yeah. It, it is strange. I will, and, but I think what's getting better about it now is that now with the, the gunmen and, and especially people in, who it seems like want notoriety for their actions, I do applaud like the news outlets that are not highlighting their names anymore. Sure. And yeah. talking Because I feel like that for so long was, I mean, we, we all knew, we all heard about all of, you know, the, the serial killer at Manson and right. Bundy and, and these names. But I, I I feel like we're getting at least well, not that it's better that you're talking about victims. It's all awful, but um, better to highlight the victims. But yeah, like I couldn't name other than um, other than oh my god, so you know I'm blinking. Um, <laughs> the beautiful actress. Um, oh, you know, Sharon, uh, Sharon Tate. Tate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Excuse me, but yeah, I mean, I don't, I couldn't name Ted Bundy's. Which no. Is, well, and that's one of the things I think has been so powerful, especially with Black Lives Matter, the whole say their names thing, which is, yeah. you know, there's something, and something that was nice about writing a book is you get a chance to sort of like remember people. And there are people like George Floyd was just a guy, you know, and, and what happened to him was horrible. And all these people now know his name and refuse to let it be forgotten. And it's one of these weird things with, with, you know, with victims of serial killers, with Columbine, with all these things, I think there needs to be this remembrance of the people who were hurt. You know, that that's such a change in how we think of things. We're so fascinated by the powerful people, by the power, people who exert their will on other people. And to remember the names of the people who were hurt, the people who were powerless, right. that's seismic. I mean, that's immense. Just really quickly, one last thing that I do want to ask about is that I felt like I read somewhere that the options for your book just got bought. Is that true? Yes. Uh, Amazon bought it to make it into a series, which is, I really like this going to be a series uh, just because, A, hey, cool. Um, yeah. But B, um, there's so much material to this book that never made it into the final draft of the book. And so I'm sure you know this, but when a TV thing's happening, the first thing they say is, well, what's season two? And I always want to be like, dude, you haven't even written season one, like one at a time. Um, but, uh, and so there's so much material I had already that there's an easy season two um, to a sort of build on this world building that didn't make it in the book. Because James Harris is not the only one like them. There's 36 others and they aren't all identical, but they are predators on humans. Um, and they don't like each other much. And the other thing that's really nice is they will have a writer's room with writers of color and women and women who have kids. And so they're going to be able to expand on these characters and take them places that I just couldn't and didn't. Um, and one thing they're really committed to is that Ms. Green is going to be sort of the lead character alongside Patricia, which I'm really, really happy about because she, to me, she and Ms. Mary, to me, are the heart of this book. And um, I'm really happy she'll get her day and her son and that other writers who relate to that experience more personally than I do will be able to do that because that'll, I'll love to see that. Oh, well, thank you so much. And um, thank you to everyone who's watching. And um, I want to make sure I hit all of the notes. Um, and follow Gr Grady, you're at, um, what is your handle just so I have it? I oh, just make sure I'm that just I'm uh, at Grady underscore Hendrix, I think, on Twitter. Books and we have. But also, um, all my social media no? stuff, my podcast, everything is just at gradyhendrix.com. So 
it's easy and simple and you can find it there.